Thank you for joining us today for Invest Malaysia Series 2, The Road to EV. I'm your panel, uh, I'll be moderating the first panel for today, where we'll discuss the various government policies that we can put in place in order for us to drive EV penetration growth here in Malaysia. To help us to understand and to navigate the government policies that are in place, we have very three distinguished panelists here with us today. We have Inche Zulmi Ahmad, the director of the Industry Development Division. Inche Zulmi has over 21 years of experience in various government policies and mainly oversaw the implementation of some of the automotive policies that are key in Malaysia, including the National Automotive Policy, as well as the National Energy Policy, or Dasat Tenaga Negara. Our second panelist, we have Inche Junaizi Muhammad No, the project director at Tenaga Malaysia, that currently heads and drives the EV development for our national utility giant. Inche Junaizi has over 30 years of experience at Tenaga, and tasked in leading the EV program, as Tanaga aspires to lead the EV growth here in Malaysia. Inche Zunaizi is also the president of the Zero Emission Vehicle Association, or Ziva, here in Malaysia. And also, he's a proud owner of a 1973 Volkswagen Beetle, <laughs> which he hopes to transform into an electric vehicle one day. And finally, our third uh, panelist is Inche Huzami Oma, the CEO, COO of Charge EV Malaysia. Charge EV Malaysia is an initiative under Green Tech Malaysia and has been instrumental in growing the EV network here in Malaysia with currently over 300 EV chargers installed nationwide. Ijit Huzaimi had previously served as a Senior Director at, of Technology Solutions at MGTC, where he also helped to develop the Low Carbon Mobility Blueprint and also to spearhead the EV charging infrastructure nationwide. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have all three of you with us here today. As we all know, Malaysia is a signatory of the Paris Agreement and also the ASEAN Fuel Economy Roadmap. We have made a commitment to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030, and also to reduce our average fuel consumption by about 26% by 2025. Through these various ministries, we have announced various policies such as the NAP, National Energy Policy, as well as the Low Carbon Mobility Blueprint. The recently announced NEP, or Dasa Tenaga Negara, has set out a target to grow EV penetration from less than 1% in 2018 to 38% by 2040. Meanwhile, Tenaga National is targeting to put out 500 EV cars on the road, and to serve those cars, they are looking to uh, put out 18,000 charging infrastructures. To help us understand and to help us to also uh, to spur the growth of EV industry, uh, they will help us to understand and navigate this, uh, the policies that we have. And before we start, we also like to remind participants who are joining us online, there is also a Q&A polling question uh, on your screen as well. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, feel free to ask and we will address them at the end of this session. Without further ado, let's begin. I think we can start with a very easy question, but I think it's so very hard to implement. Why is EV very important for Malaysia, and how does it help in order for us to, make, uh, for, to drive Malaysia to achieve its emission growth? Jesuimi? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the first question is really challenging because you want to set uh, some kind of a direction uh, where this uh, discussion will be heading. Uh, I also would like to take a point before I answer your question to thank uh, Busa Misha and Macquarie for organizing this event and giving opportunity for uh, Miti to share and expose uh, on the policy uh, with regard to EV and also NAP 2020. So to answer your question, uh, as we all know, transport uh, sector uh, is the second largest contributor in terms of carbon, uh, CO2 emissions. So hence, uh, there's a need for the government to look at on how we can 
actually uh, help to ensure that the in increment can be uh, controlled or reduced. So under NAP 2020, actually uh, the directive is to uh, promote uh, energy efficient vehicles and also at the same time to promote next generation vehicles. So next generation vehicles means uh, intelligent vehicles uh, where they have a certain level of uh, autonomous uh, level three and also embedded with uh, efficiency in terms of uh, fuel consumption and also emission. This NAP 2020 is actually a continuation of NAP 2014, whereby we want to promote energy efficient vehicles. So uh, a lot of initiative has been outlined in NAP 2020 to ensure that we fulfill a uh, commitment that we have either at uh, COP or even ASEAN fuel economic uh, targets. So uh, in terms of uh, achieving this goal, actually, uh, actually we are, have seen a uh, kind of success rate in terms of penetration of energy efficient vehicles out of TIV. TIV is uh, sales, sales of motor vehicles uh, for a year. So uh, it means uh, it's good because almost 80% of uh, our TIV are EEV. Uh, including electric vehicles. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yes, it, it's interesting that you point out. I think the NAP has been very successful in terms of promoting uh, energy efficient vehicles, uh, which obviously the, the measure of the basis of measurement is by in terms of emissions. And, and I think uh, the NAP also has done very well in terms of uh, offering incentives for a lot of car manufacturers or OEM manufacturers uh, to produce cars. Uh, that uh, number one, that, that, that we the incentives to make it much cheaper for, for, for consumers to buy, and, and at the same time also help Malaysia achieve its uh, emission goals as well by 2050. Um, as, as you rightly point out, the, the NAP 2020 is still, um, I guess, in a way, uh, it's an extension of this policy which is very much focused on EVV. Um, and in, in, in your opinion, do you, uh, how much of, uh, of the electric vehicle will have to feature much strongly in terms of the policies uh, moving forward because as we understand it as well um, with the new Dasa Tenaga Negara, um, uh, MITI is the entity that is spearheading uh, towards the uh, adoption of electric vehicle as well and if we are hoping to hit uh, a target let's say of 38% um, the, I believe that the, a lot of work has, a lot more work will have to be done for, for, for EVs. Yeah. So, what, what do you think is the next step for moving forward? Uh, if we get to the question, uh, under NAP 2020, it doesn't say that uh, we must focus on only ICE, ICE model. So, uh, it stated that uh, the direction will move from hybrid to EV and perhaps future will be f uh, fuel cell uh, uh, EV. So, uh, MITI, uh, we, has take, we have take, uh, we have take the, we have take the initiative to set uh, EV task force actually mm -hmm. at the emergency level to ensure uh, coordination efforts uh, are uh, taken because uh, I, if you can see in Malaysia, uh, we have a lot of ministries and agencies that uh, uh, have the patient with regard to EV. So, uh, uh, certain roadmaps or blueprint was, uh, were introduced. So, I think uh, MITI has taken this initiative to, to coordinate everything mm. so that uh, we don't have uh, redundant of uh, resources in terms of uh, championing a certain initiative. We also uh, need to relook at what are the uh, immediate action needed uh, to promote EV. Because under low carbon mobility blueprint, uh, it was in their study, in their study, it uh, uh, stated that uh, they found that uh, in order for, to support this uh, uh, green agenda, uh, the target uh, at least 15% of uh, TIV should be uh, EV by 2030. 
and later uh, Ministry of Energy, sorry, uh, uh, PMO, and means uh, produce another document. It's a national energy policy, of which uh, the setting is the, the target is uh, 38 percent by 2040. So having the target, I think, will provide a clear direct sense of direction uh, to the government to ensure that everybody uh, at the same page and to ensure that initiatives are well coordinated and will support uh, each other. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, I think it's it's very important that we have a set clear target, and also I understand that even the Dasa Tanagar has set out action plans for us to achieve these targets. And it will require a lot of coordination from all the various uh, ministries as well as the stakeholders. Um, speaking of stakeholders, obviously, Tanaga National would have to play a very important role in terms of spearheading the EV growth, considering that you are the energy provider and you also need to, um, to, to the spearhead in terms of the network of infrastructure. Uh, maybe, Inchizunaiji, can you share with us, uh, uh, because Tanaga also has come up with certain targets like in terms of how many charges that you're, uh, you're looking at by 2030 and how many EV cars you're envisioning. Um, you can share with us what are some of the things that you have done over at Tanaga and also how some of the policies have enabled you to grow within this space. Uh, thank you, Max. Um, yeah, uh, also, thank you to Bursa for inviting us as well as Macquarie. Um, we're very excited to join this forum actually and uh, to share our, our, what we have done so far uh, in, in order to proliferate the EVs here in Malaysia. Okay, as far as Tanaga is concerned, um, as what, what you like point, pointed out, we, play, um, we, we see we play a major role because electricity is going to be the fuel for these vehicles. You know, without, without that fuel, electricity, I don't think any of these EVs can run on, the, on our roads, right? And the, Tanaga being the, the biggest uh, electricity provider here in Malaysia, that role is even more important. So, um, so, so by saying that, Tanaga is actually going to be involved very, very actively in the infrastructure side of things. Meaning, um, like for example, in, in the EV ecosystem, there are four elements in there. The first one is the EV itself, right? Without the EVs, I, I don't think we are here. Secondly is the grid, the electricity grid, where electricity is channeled from the power stations. Third is the charging points, you know, where we, we connect the grid to the vehicles to, to transmit the electric, electricity uh, or electrical energy to the, to the vehicles. And number four is the software or the app, which is the ones who are going to, people use to operate the, the charges. So among these four elements, TMB is not going to play in the first one, which is the EVs, because we are not a car manufacturer, we are not a car, we're not in that business anyway. So, but the other three is where we're going to play actively in. Yeah, so um, as far as our roles are concerned, Max, uh, I'm going to make sure that there is, our grid is robust enough to cater for the new, I guess, demand or new load, which is EV load, EV charging load. Number two is the charging infrastructure itself, the charging points. We are going to make sure that there is enough uh, in this country to cater for uh, users, the growing number of users, especially the, to, to cater for the range anxiety, people who travel long distances. And thirdly, the app that goes with the charger. So, um, so um, soon you will see a network of TNB chargers um, on, um, along, our, along highways and also uh, the major trunk routes. So really, our role is really in the infrastructure side of things. We want to make sure that that uh, uh, element in the ecosystem really uh, supports the proliferation of EVs here in Malaysia. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Maybe we should also move on to, um, to charge EV as well, uh, Jay Buzami. Um, charge EV is an entity under MGTC which has been very instrumental in spearheading the initial rollout of charging infrastructure in, here in Malaysia. I think you have about 300 charges uh, already. Um, yeah, maybe I think it's best to come from you to share with us how much what the work has been done here at Charge EV. And, and what has been the challenges, and also, um, and and also, what's the what, what are we looking at moving forward as well? Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, thank you, Bursa, uh, for having uh, us here uh, today. So it's quite a broad uh, question over there. Not sure, it's like how much time that you're actually allocating for me to answer uh, to answer that. 
The HRGV started uh, in around 2016. Uh, of course, with the government support, we received a grant uh, from EIBE uh, at the time with about 5 million ringgit, where the task is to roll out the first 200 uh, EV charging points in, in Malaysia. So mind you, at the time that uh, the, the industry and, and the whole society is not very much open to the idea of the EV, so I would like uh, to think like a charge EV play a huge role in terms of like uh, opening the doors and also the possibilities of, of where we are uh, today. So uh, even that we had the, the mandate and the money at the time to roll out the first 200 charges, the challenges were, were massive. So uh, uh, all around uh, the acceptance levels uh, were low. Uh, people are not confident, not even giving out their space. Uh, unused space, some of those, uh, even for free. Uh, so what we, what we had done is actually to build up the value of having the, the EV charger uh, at the premise. So, uh, uh, so that is, that is uh, pretty much like a how, how we uh, started uh, at the time and slowly uh, things uh, started to change. Yeah, the acceptance level ha has been uh, much higher. What we also did in the charge EV last time is that we monitored and we uh, analyze what is the, the usage uh, pattern, uh, the data that we extract from that, which has been sent to all over and various uh, part of uh, agencies and also uh, organizations in Malaysia as well. So uh, this, this uh, kind of like help us to, to actually, uh, to give a better uh, direction, uh, better accuracy in terms of the rollout. So I, I must say that uh, at the first level, and, and even you can still see some of the locations that we have today, is, is a bit like uh, underutilized, but it, it's all for, for good cause uh, at the time. We spread it uh, everywhere, whoever that wanted to adopt it, there are huge uh, support coming from the federal government, also the state government, especially Selangor at the time, and then also TNB was very supportive uh, at the time alongside all the other ministries as well. So from, from the tabulations that we have, here we understand better. Today we understand better uh, on how exactly that we can actually roll out uh, in, in Malaysia. So for instance, it's like you see, we, we, have, we have some charges that we put on the highway that is on the lower power. We know that there is not the, the accurate uh, configuration today. So some, some of the moving forward that we are doing, all the six charges that we have on the highway today, uh, is gonna be upgraded to the high power DC. We are just going through the process right now on getting the approval and then the, the uh, upgrade is, is coming in due time. There are also certain locations that we know we can't put too, too fast charges because people are actually staying for like one, two hours. So, so this, this correlation is something that we have something that we also share uh, with, uh, with uh, everybody here in Malaysia. Yeah, uh, along the way as well, I think Charge EV has played a big role into like a shaping some, or supporting some of the policy and the directions, uh, and also filling in the gaps. Some of the gaps at the time uh, was just like uh, the training, uh, getting the, the human capital uh, or the resources level. So we work with the uh, uh, Jabatan Pembangunan Standard in Malaysia, uh, developing the national occupancy uh, skill standards for the EV charging and to seek, uh, ins ensure the safety. We're also part of this uh, technical committee uh, for, for, the, for the standards and we had adopted the key standard that is required to ensure that the safety is being adhered uh, in Malaysia. But uh, having, having all said all that, this is more like a trying to, to push for the EV agenda uh, for, for Malaysia. Uh, this is what Charge EV were doing before. Now we are moving on into the next phase where we need to, to go big, we need to expand, we need, we need to be commercialized. So this is where we, we are having this opportunity now with the joint venture that we have with the uh, Yinsen Group uh, under Yinsen Green Technology. So this is, uh, now is setting us a new pace, giving us a new pace on how we're gonna roll out the, the EV charging. Today we have about close to 400 charges. Yeah, the recent one that, that we have is a collaboration that we have with uh, Starbucks. Even, even that is a testing platform also for us. We know some of the configuration is not really accurate through the few, like a month feedback that we got from, from the user now. So that can be, that will be improved uh, in the future. We also have like a, we're going to, to go for the phase two. 
where we are gonna populate the the charger in in whole Malaysia level, and then also we have uh, another key collaborations that that we already signing, uh, like with Aeon and a few others, yeah, on on moving forward. Yeah, maybe I I leave it at that for now. Okay, all right. Th thank you so much. Um, so would you say in terms of uh, when you're trying to route the initial uh, uh, the initial rollout of uh, infrastructure, charging infrastructure, uh, you find that the main challenge is actually coming from the configurations of the uh, of the installation. Is, 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 that, is that what I correct, uh, correctly understand? Uh, that is kind of like the outcome that we got uh, from the installations. So the there they are two key uh, challenges actually. I think everybody is in the field right now uh, might agree with me. One is to acquire the sites. The site acquisition is, is one of the key uh, issues. That is the part that we think that we managed to kind of like soften the ground uh, at a time whereby now people are more receptive onto hosting the charges. Some even want to pay for it. Yeah, so there's, the, the numbers is quite uh, a lot as well. The other one is, is the availability of the uh, power at the locations that actually match to where we, we actually want to position the, the charges. Yeah, the Malaysia, I think that in terms of the energy or the power level, TNB is probably is very secure level, uh, high security of uh, electricity. So the, the energy is there, it's just to bring it to the location, which now, like uh, Encik Zola mentioned earlier, we have the EV task force. It's become one of the platform for us in Malaysia to resolve some of these uh, issues. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Regarding the, your, 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 I think your sharing of challenge for some of the asset owners for them to open up their space for them to install a charger. Um, I believe that I guess with, with the two recent budget, you have budget that is very much uh, catered towards number one uh, to to cater to the consumers uh, to, to purchase potential purchases of EV cars by giving you tax exemption. And the second one, I think, is also more uh, tax exemption for uh, what you call a bet uh, EV charging manufacturers. Uh, do you think that, let's say, uh, if we have a source of incentives uh, for, for infrastructure owners for them to actually install EVs, this will actually help to able to spur uh, more installation moving forward? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, for now, uh, if I get it correct, that we already have the green investment tax allowance uh, that actually benefit for the asset owner. Uh, they're actually uh, hosting the charges. The, the guitar, oh, this is quite commonly known in, in Malaysia, I suppose. Uh, but on the other part is uh, for the charge point operator. So charge point operator, the one that is uh, heavily investing uh, into the, the uh, establishment, the charges, and then all the OPEX and CAPEX associated with it. This is something that, that we are happy to, to hear that is going towards that, uh, that direction, but we're waiting for the definitive parts of it. So they, 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 we definitely require a lot of assistance on the charge point uh, operator perspective in terms of the incentive. Okay, understood. Um, yeah. All right, yeah, maybe on that we can also pivot to Tanaga. Um, I guess for Tanaga, you, you have, you, I mean, you have uh, access to the national grid and you will be a very much, have a very good, better understanding in terms of what sort of uh, power supply they would need in terms of the, uh, in order for you to support such a, a wide infrastructure network. Uh, so far, I think as I Uzami has shared as well, I think you do find some, uh, some challenges as well. And, and, and from TNB's perspective, um, how, how can we overcome uh, and yeah, overcome these challenges? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, yeah, what, what was rightly pointed out by Chief Uzami earlier, power supply, we have access actually in, in, from the generation side of things. But how to get this, this power supply to the point where we want to install the chargers is where the challenge is. Because well, what, what he really pointed out also that the first one is space, right? Is where we're going to locate these chargers at. Once we, we know where to, 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 to put the chargers, then we need to, to lay the cables to this charger. So before, before we do that, we want to make sure that in that area, there's enough capacity. If there's not enough, if the, if the capacity is not enough, we've got to do something about it. We've got to upgrade the power supply there. Um, if, if, if it's enough, it's just straightforward. Just just, pull, uh, just lay the cables, connect to the charger, and you're set. But the challenge is when there's not enough. Because when you, there's not enough you know, to do, do the upgrades, do upgrades, you need to get all sorts of um, 
uh, uh, what do you call that, approvals from the authorities. To lay the cables, for example, you know, if, if, if that route involves um, uh, a land that is owned by the state, for example, that's where you know, things can, can get a bit complicated. So the approval process is where the challenge is, uh, Max, at this point. That, which is why MITI is now, uh, um, they have a, a special committee that's looking into this process. And we really appreciate the, the, the effort that's been taken by MITI um, in, 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 in uh, facilitating this process. Um, that's one of the challenges. The second challenge is, of course, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, the availability of power supply there. The, um, the, of course, the upgrading, you know, we, we, that's our bread and butter, actually. But sometimes we, we find challenges because of shortage of uh, components. You know, um, you know, with the COVID, you know, it's not only the, 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 uh, the chips, uh, the microchips that are having problem, but also raw materials like copper. You know, our cables are all copper cables, right? So um, these are some of the challenges that we had earlier. But I think uh, things are going to get better. Um, and um, these challenges will be, will, be, will be soon, you know, with, 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 as things get better, you know, as, as the economy uh, picks up, we should be able to, to deliver um, uh, the, the resources or, or, sorry, the infrastructure much more uh, uh, earlier and faster. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Um, all right. A, a question for Miti. Um, I think the, the trajectory where I think people are expecting at this point in time is uh, a slow transition from ICE cars, non-EVs car, to hybrid and, and, to, uh, and have to finally to uh, full battery EVs. Uh, in your opinion, um, based on the, with the, with the current policies that we have, uh, based on the current infrastructure investments that the OEMs and also whatever supply chain has in, in, in Malaysia, do you think that Malaysia will be, be able to jump ahead uh, let's say from a ice transit from ice cars to straight away to battery EV, or do we still need to go through that slow transition from uh, ice to hybrid to uh, to full EV? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Max, for the question. Uh, uh, yes, we have this target. I said just now, uh, fifteen percent of the EV or 38% of TIV by 2040, 15% by 2030. So this XEV, we include, uh, uh, we call it electrified vehicles, which can uh, comprise uh, either, uh, both uh, hybrid and also uh, full EV. So uh, there are uh, different thoughts about this uh, the approach, yeah? when you said whether we need to jump straight away or whether we need transition. Uh, we, Malaysia have this, we, we have manufacturer, we have uh, assemblers uh, of vehicles. So manufacturers are like uh, our national uh, projects, uh, Proton and Prodor. So whereby they, uh, they don't just assemble, they also uh, involve in uh, uh, designing of a car and capable to build, a, they call it top hat, eh? top hat. Eh? Top head, uh -huh. So, uh, by having this measure, we have the base uh, involving uh, 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 vendors uh, who are supporting uh, our Proton and Produa, as well as other uh, OEMs. So, thus, uh, if you want to jump straight away, I think. Uh, will be uh, a bit risk to the extent. But of course, we allow, uh, I mean, we are not saying that we, uh, it's possible, but we still allow hybrid to grow at the same time. Because uh, technology in uh, uh, EV uh, can uh, change in a rapid, in a rapid uh, way, in, including the infrastructure. So uh, we, I think Malaysia uh, take a step to, to ensure that uh, we progressively develop the industry. Yeah, That's the approach that we are uh, considering right now. But as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, without saying that, um, the government as a whole, I think, agreed to push forward uh, uh, EV itself. Yeah, that's why uh, Malaysia already established this EV task force, which focuses more on 
uh, full electric vehicles. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think things are definitely looking up. I think you should have uh, battery manufacturers like Samsung, SDI come in to invest in Malaysia. And also you see uh, people like Proton and, uh, and um, also trying to bring in more EV cars. Um, obviously, we have to start somewhere. Um, CBU is obviously it's the first step before we actually start um, uh, developing the technology know-how and also to bring costs down. Uh, as we understand that a battery makes up about quite substantial, about 30-40% of uh, if EV cars on the road. Um, yeah, but I also think that's also posed quite an interesting challenge as well uh, for, for us. Um, I think the, a, lot, a lot of the challenge for consumers to switch to EVs is probably the pricing of cars. Uh, I think on average, the EV car that you can buy now is probably 150000 uh, uh, on the road. Um, whereas I think uh, in order for you to really spur mass adoption, you will probably need to target cars uh, that are probably priced about seventy to 80000 which obviously are uh, basically uh, uh, dominated by your national cars as well as some of your B segments, Japanese marks. Uh, in your opinion, um, like for example, like EV cars, we have managed to bring car prices down uh, by providing incentives under the NAP. Um, and moving forward, do you think that the same strategies will be able to help to bring EV car prices to something that's very much more accessible to the mass market? Uh, it's like Zoo or anyone that can uh, yeah, help us clarify this. Okay, thank you again for the question. Uh, EV Task Force, one of the things that we look at the moment uh, is uh, two main uh, strategies. One is uh, how we want to ensure that or how we want to promote more EV on the road. And, and second is how we want to expedite, expedite the, the development of EV infrastructure. So these two should uh, move in parallel. If you have EV first, focus on EV only, the, the, the vehicles, then we might have a problem in terms of support. And uh, this uh, issue will not be resolved, like a range of anxiety among consumers, so forth. Uh, so the, the, the step uh, right now that we take is that to look back at the current policy of importation of uh, CBU vehicles. Uh, but in particular, uh, EV. Uh, of course, we would like to see uh, more vehicles to be produced in the country, EV. Uh, we hope uh, current uh, investors that we have and also future investors are welcome to, to set up their business here to uh, capture the market of EV in Malaysia. Uh, but for the moment, I think we, also, we take that approach to uh, relax uh, the current uh, uh, importation uh, requirement so that more EV, especially affordable EV, can be, uh, uh, can be brought into, uh, into the country. Uh, on infrastructure, uh, uh, we have uh, targets, actually, uh, maybe I have not mentioned just now. Uh, we have uh, 10,000 uh, uh, EV uh, charging uh, that we want to have by 2025, of which uh, 1,000 will be fast charging. So we have identified, under your EV task force, we have identified uh, uh, champions, I would say champions, that can spearhead, spearhead or become catalysts to support uh, the government's agenda. Of course, uh, it's not exhaustive, and not only them, but can be other players. Uh, uh, so we hope uh, the targets can be achieved to support uh, 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 the adoption of EV uh, in the country. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add um, to what Zulmi has mentioned. Um, as far as TNB is concerned, we see four major challenges when it comes to proliferating EVs here in Malaysia. Number one is, of course, as what was mentioned earlier, the prices of EVs. You know, um, but then when you look at uh, uh, expenditure on, on vehicles, right, we, we don't have to look at only the price of EVs, the acquisition price, or acquisition cost, sorry. You've got to look at the, the overall you know, life cycle cost of EVs compared to maybe ICE vehicles. It may be a bit more expensive, 
but the savings will be there as you reuse the car in the long run. Um, that's number one, prices of EVs, the, the, the cost of EVs, the acquisition cost. The second one is actually the infrastructure. I mean, uh, that's the, or the lack of it, uh, charging infrastructure. That's the second challenge. Um, we still, although there are a lot of efforts, there are a lot of targets that are being put in place, but, you know, um, in reality, we are still lacking here in Malaysia. Um, all, all of, uh, along the North-South Expressway, there's only about six or seven now uh, charges that are there, but we are, we are happy to, to, to see development along th that highway that by the end of this year, there will be close to 20 that's going to be commissioned, which is good you know, for, for long, long, long range travellers. The third challenge is actually the uh, government friendly policies or the lack of it again, you know. Um, but we are also, we are so happy that uh, there are a few, there are a number of uh, incentives that are already introduced by the government that for CBU cars, you know, there's no import duty, there's no um, uh, excise duty, um, road tax is zero now also until 2025, which is good, you know. But we still need more because, for example, um, those who stay in condominiums, there's a big challenge now to, 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 uh, install, char to install charges in condominiums. So we probably need, moving forward, we need, we need more friendly policies from the Kementerian Perumahan, for example, to, 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 to enable uh, new developments to, to have uh, 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 charging infrastructure. The, the fourth element is the support industry, which, which is the uh, mechanics, the technicians. I mean, if you, if you use an EV, you know, there's, there's, a, there's only a, a certain time that you want to rely on your OEMs. After that, you're gonna find, you need to find people who are really good at servicing EVs. So these are the four challenges that what we see in TNB um, uh, to, 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 um, uh, that, that can hamper our efforts. But there are five, and TNB is looking at five major areas, five focus areas to address, this solution, address these issues. The first one is um, this reskilling and upskilling of, of mechanics and technicians. Um, we think this is very important because um, um, uh, without this expert group of uh, mechanics and technicians, I don't think we have enough people or enough expertise to service our vehicles. So that is why in, in ILSAS, our training institute, we have come up with a program for, for, for companies to send their technicians and mechanics to reskill and upskill them. You know? Um, uh, electric vehicles are different from, from ICE vehicles because there are th only three elements that are, that are active there. The first one is the battery. And battery needs, you know, the, that's an, a technology of its own, this battery. More and more like chemical engineering, more about, more about chemistry. The second one is the motor drive. Electric vehicles don't have engines. They have motor drives, DC motor drives. And that's another subject matter that is very uh, specific. And thirdly, is the software. Electric vehicles rely a lot of software. All the interconnecting material, uh, uh, elements are all controlled by the battery management system, which is actually an you know, uh, electric co electronic component. And this is where the software uh, uh, interface with, the, with the, all the active components I mentioned earlier. So first is the focus area is reskilling upskilling. Um, we are happy to say that uh, ILSA is already working with, with uh, some OEMs to retrain and upskill their, 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 their technicians and mechanics. The second focus that TNB is making uh, currently is to electrify our fleet. You know, TNB has about 4,200 vehicle, strong vehicles in, in, in our fleet. And we are slowly changing um, um, our vehicles to electric, to electric vehicles. So, um, like for example, um, um, uh, the strategy, yeah, the strategy that we, we do is not to change like you know one shot. It's going to be very heavy uh, on our on our capex. So whenever the vehicles are due for replacement, if there are uh, uh, an EV alternative, we're going to get we're going to take that EV alternative. So that is strategy that we're making on on uh, on this focus number focus area number two. The third focus is of course the charging infrastructure. We want to make sure that our grid is, is ever ready, as I mentioned earlier, ever ready to, to take in this new load. We want to make sure that there's access to, to our grid wherever the charges are, go uh, uh, are going to be installed. Yeah? So that is the third focus area. The fourth is to work together with partners. And this is where Ziva was formed, uh, Zero Emission Vehicle Association. Okay, we formed Ziva, whose members are organizations and also companies that have the same uh, 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 interest and, and like-mindedness 
which is to proliferate EVs here in Malaysia. So we have members from the car manufacturers there. We have uh, uh, even the owners, owners of EVs are there, representatives are there. TNB is there as well. And we have the, the import car importers is there. So uh, we aspire to be the voice of EV here in Malaysia. And we're happy to note that um, during, before, before the, the announcement of the budget uh, recently, Ziva was one of the parties that was consulted by the Minister of Finance to, 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 to um, gain inputs uh, uh, before they make that, those, those, some announcements. And the fifth element is, of course, uh, the um, studies. You know, we have in TNB, we have Uniten, we have TNB Research, and we, and, and we have experts there to conduct all these studies, uh, you know, in new technologies in EV that can support the, the, the industry in the long run. So we see four challenges and we have about five um, uh, uh, focus areas that we, we, we make or well, we, we work on currently to address those challenges. Thank you. Uh, from the charging infrastructure provider, like CPO standpoint, of course we want to be very much uh, to be on the demand base. So there is something that we are shifting uh, heavily right now. Like what I said earlier, we got uh, all the previous data. Now we are using it for, for better accuracy of the rollout. So it's more like a demand base. And the demand must come from the vehicles. So, right? so, uh, and the first point of our decision making for the user, as what we see even in the poll earlier, is that the, the price is, is very sensitive. So people are looking into, into the, the price point uh, of the vehicles. Uh, while I was uh, doing the study last time, so we also look into the uh, pricing profile of the Malaysian uh, spending. So uh, we see it's like uh, 450,000 ringgit that you mentioned. Uh, it actually covers uh, 150,000 ringgit and upwards it covers about 25% uh, of the market uh, in Malaysia. More than 200,000 ringgit is about 5%. And most of the EV today is actually uh, saturated is within this more than 200,000 ringgit. So we want to shift it uh, to the left side, which is why the incentive and the policy are very, very important for us to, to enable uh, the shifting. If we, if we can go as low as uh, like 70%, uh, vehicles that actually cost 70%, uh, 70,000 ringgit and less is actually cover close to 50% of the Malaysian uh, total total market. So we see it's like as it go to the to the left, which we have a lot of like policy instrument, incentive instrument now helping to push so we can get more uh, EV and then we can get more demand. So on the CPO uh, perspective, we will follow where the demand will be. We expand according to, to the demand. And within the group, we also have uh, rather than uh, Purchasing the vehicles, you can. We also provide like a leasing option. So to, this is uh, to to actually to cater to the segment that doesn't want to to provide uh, or to own the vehicles, because the battery life still uh, haunts some of the people's uh, mind as well. So this option also available uh, within the group. So we have this product we call Hyperdrive uh, within uh, Insan Green Technology. They're providing this uh, leasing program. So, so a lot of effort being done on to like uh, pushing on the demand side as well to enable the CPUs. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have a few questions already uh, that come that's coming from the audience. So we we'll try to perhaps try to answer some of this, uh, more the interesting ones. Um, maybe just a more basic. What is the current? Uh, what's the current number of uh, charging? Or charges here already nationwide, and roughly what's the split between DC and AC, and and where do we think that what sort of ratio that do we need in order to achieve our targets? Let's say by 2025 or 2030. Based on uh, information that we gathered from MGTC, uh, in terms of infra, right now we have about. 700 uh, plus, I would say, 700 plus of uh, EV charging station uh, nationwide, uh, not uh, concentrated on certain areas, but uh, spread uh, all over Malaysia. Uh, out of this, about uh, 70, I think, about 70 uh, uh, DC, fast charging, uh, mainly in areas like highway, uh, as well as uh, destination area. 
So, uh, yeah, you have 700 to 10,000, uh, sorry, seven, uh, yeah, 700 to 10,000, uh, there's a big gap there. So it's a, a challenge to us to how to make sure that this can uh, realize. So that's why I think uh, Junedi mentioned just now that under Evitas Force, we have this uh, special committee looking at uh, creating uh, a more conducive, uh, a more uh, facilitative environment for uh, CPO uh, uh, or for, for setting up the EV infra, uh, looking at the, uh, the process and procedures, etc. So that uh, we can uh, simplify, it, simplify it and also uh, shorten uh, the process. Uh, I think that is, uh, beside incentive, that is also critical actually for investors. So uh, this is uh, happening. Uh, we hope we will be able to come up with uh, the final proposal on this. But of course, this involves uh, engagement with various stakeholders, uh, including uh, PBT and uh, other agencies, government agencies. Yeah. Incidentally, the, the largest now concentration of EV charges is right here in KL, in KLCC. <laughs> there are 47 uh, charges there, um, I think four of which are DC charges, fast charges, so whenever I go to KLCC, I always charge my car and, you know, so, so very convenient. And we hope that become an example for other um, um, asset owners, other building owners to also install uh, destination charges, uh, shopping centres, for example, hotels, you know, come and join the wave, you know, so to speak, uh, and, and install charges uh, because it can be a good um, uh, 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 extra, uh, extra revenue for them as well. You know, we, for example, hotels, right? If I travel, I, I drive an EV for, for the past uh, six months and whenever I travel, I will always find, try to find a hotel that has a charger. You know, and um, that's where I'm going to stay, you know, because that's where I'm going to charge my car when I stay there. Lah. <laughs> so if, if, um, um, if, there, if more hotels install more charges, then it will be good for everyone actually. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, one question. Can you elaborate in, on the grid capacity to support EV charging? And do we actually have the excess energy for, for us to drive EV growth? Yeah. Um, rest assured, the grid is always uh, 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 there. And, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, whenever there's a charger that needs to be installed in a certain location, if there, there is capacity then we will just pull a cable, connect it to the charger, and we're all set. But if there's no capacity, not enough, sorry, not enough capacity, definitely we have to do some upgrades. But um, I'm happy to say that TNB has come up with a green lane for, for applicants that want to install charges uh, in, 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 this, uh, in these areas. And this green lane is shorten, shortening the process from, uh, from um, uh, 55 days to 22 days. You know, before we can, before we, we actually install that. But that, of course, with uh, in, in areas where we have capacity and there is no um, uh, inc encumbrances in pulling the, the connectivity to the charger. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, TMB is doing its part to, 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 to facilitate things when it comes to uh, infrastructure development. Yeah, we also have one question. Um, can you, what is the business model for charging stations? Um, yeah, I think you have to make it attractive for asset owners, right, in order for them to, to install charges. Yeah, there, there are actually uh, various models that we are exploring uh, right now. The previous one that, that we have, uh, the, the legacy model, is, is the 240 ringgit membership fees. Uh, most of Malaysian plug-in hybrid or EV drivers is aware uh, about this one. About this 240 ringgit, just uh, just try try to picture, uh, uh, try to give a future visualization where we are heading with this. Yeah, so the 240 ringgit at the time it was a device when we were in MGTC, and uh, the idea at the time is to to have a bit of like a operational expenditure for us to sustain uh, the operations, and at the same time promoting uh, the charging behavior. So at the time, the plug-in hybrid. 
is is dominating the market in Malaysia. Only since uh, last year that the market is really opening up. Now we have a shortage of electric vehicles to come to Malaysia. So people are actually queuing, queuing up to get their EV in Malaysia now. But previously, uh, plug-in hybrid is a, is a, is a market. So a plug-in hybrid uh, segment, they have the choice whether they charge or not charge. If they're using the, the engine, it's going to be bad for the environment. They're going using the electricity, it's going to be good. So we, we want to drive the behavioral change. So that is how this number we derive, and that's translated to about 20 ringgit per month. You reverse that calculation to the tariff here, you get about 40 kilowatt hour of battery worth, uh, of electricity worth. For plug-in hybrid, typically you take five charging sessions. For EV today, <laughs> one time done. So you, you consume all the quota or, or this uh, quota there. So we need to look back uh, into, into what are the numbers and whether we want to even sustain uh, this uh, membership scheme with this uh, existing pricing. So now we start looking into the pay-per-use model. Pay-per-use model is now enable uh, anybody that want to charge, they, have, they can get immediate access to the charger. And right now, based on the limitation that we have today, uh, it is still uh, like a kilowatt hour base, it's still energy base, but now it's being translated into the time scale. Yeah, so that is where we are today, and we are looking into like combining both of these elements into the pricing. Of course, we cannot uh, expect the same uh, pricing as what uh, of the electricity cost at home or at office because now you have like a huge capex and operation associated with it. So in Malaysia right now, the range is, is about one ringgit twenty cent, one ringgit forty cents per kilowatt hour which is equivalent to, to per minute, if you, if you reverse uh, calculate that. And we're still observing how the market is actually uh, accepting this. And, and so far, it has been okay. Yeah, of course, uh, for, for the EV charging, uh, the home charging element also uh, tied up together. So what we are not really sure uh, at the moment is, is like this low power AC chargers, which once we start to have these uh, full electric vehicles to populate the road, we observe it's like it's a massive behavioral change. Like the demand uh, expectation for the charging is different from BEV to the plug-in hybrid. Yeah. So, so Chief Junaizu, one of the owners, also, so he he would be able to to share his experience as well. I am as a user as well. I I notice that that behavioral change. So we are adapting to it. So, uh, but now it's still uh, representing the higher uh, income level uh, group that own the EV today. So that is still uh, be some of the uh, attraction for the site owners to participate uh, into this. Yeah. So, but soon we are also preparing for for the uh, mass market as well. So, yeah. So that, that is how we, we are seeing right now the, we, a lot of people want to collaborate uh, with us. So with this basis, we do provide a good level of services and there are some level of security that we, we provided to them. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are about time, but I think there's one, maybe we can tackle one final question. I think it's very interesting. I think we've been really focusing very much on light vehicles, uh, but this question is basically... Uh, if you're just focusing on EVs for sedan or light vehicles, we are not addressing the emission by heavier vehicles, such as uh, two-wheelers or even like your logistic trucks and whatnot. And ultimately, this will not result in reduction of the emission that we are looking for. Uh, yeah, do you have any comment on this? Uh, we are seeing like the two wheels, two wheelers also as a big market, it's a big potential. The reason is that the, the price gap between the existing uh, motorcycle today to the electric motorcycle is much narrow compared to the to the uh, passenger vehicles. So within the group, we have the we have Oika, the one that we are trying to to push to to start in Malaysia with a battery swapping system because uh, when you come to the motorcycle, one way to reduce further the cost of ownership is to take away the cost of the battery from the motorcycle altogether. So this is something that we are enabling uh, right now as well. And previously under the low carbon mobility blueprint, we did not look into the heavy duty vehicles uh, on the logistic uh, spectrum on this one. 
but now actually it is opening up so so we have uh, now we are discussing with uh, swift uh, logistic that is adopting the electric trucks so there will be a first electric trucks coming in malaysia and we're going to be part of that charging infrastructure to support this initiative as well so what i would want to say is like the ev now can cover the, all the uh, transport spectrum uh, in malaysia it's no longer limited to the three yeah, just wanted to add, um, I mentioned earlier that TMB wants to um, convert its fleet, right? But the challenge is to get commercial vehicles here in Malaysia. We, we don't have much, much uh, we don't have much supply of, of these commercial vehicles. That's the main challenge. Like 35 to 40% of our vehicles are four-wheel drive and also pickup trucks, yeah? And also vans, service vans. Um, but there's no, 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 there's not many um, choices that we have at this point. So we want to welcome also, perhaps Miti can do a bit uh, on, on that bit, to also attract uh, manufacturers uh, who uh, manufacture um, uh, uh, commercial vehicles to come to Malaysia and market their vehicles here. So that's one of the, the challenges. I mean, fleet is, for me, for me, for me, fleet is a low-hanging fruit for us to... <laughs> to increase the number of EVs, right? I mean, there are a lot of logistics companies here in Malaysia, and there's potential, actually, to, to convert their vehicles to electric vehicles. But the supply, that's where we... Uh, one of the, one of the uh, ch challenges in this sector, actually. Yeah. Can I just add? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the target that I said just now is uh, inclusive of both passenger and commercial vehicles. So commercial vehicles include uh, trucks and van. So therefore, uh, it is part of the agenda. So uh, in terms of supply, uh, manufacturer or local producer, we actually have received uh, many interests uh, from uh, uh, many companies from different, different, uh, from different, different sources. So uh, I think it's a matter of time to, to realize, to see this. Uh, in next uh, one or two two years, because once we approve uh, license for companies to produce uh, commercial vehicles, including trucks, normally they may take uh, one or two years to start their production. So hopefully by then uh, we have enough uh, supply. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I believe that's all the time that we have today. Thank you for sharing your insights and. Um, and helping us to understand the policies as well as these uh, challenges and opportunities implementing the EV ecosystem here in Malaysia. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll be right back with our second panel, to, uh, second panel session at 10.45. Thank you.